Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast. Today's reading has been edited and adapted from the book Getting On by Orison Sweat Martin, one of the authors who is featured prominently in our book Evergreen, 50 Inspirational Life Lessons. To learn more about our hardcover book of classic motivational essays, please visit inspirationallifelessons.com. Now on to our reading. The leaders of the world, be it in business, science, or the arts, have ever been precedent breakers. Timid people, no matter how able, never make leaders. Fearlessness and originality are characteristic of all leaders of progress. They have no reverence for the old simply because it is old. With them it is always a question of pushing forward, of improving on the past, instead of slavishly copying it. Men and women who have blazed new paths for civilization have always been precedent breakers. It is ever the individual who believes in their own idea who can think and act without a crowd to back them, who is not afraid to stand alone, who is bold, original, resourceful, who has the courage to go where others have never been, to do what others have never done, that accomplishes things, that leaves their mark on their times. Do not be afraid of being original. Do not be a copy of your father, your mother, your grandparents, which would be as foolish as it would be for the violet to try to be a rose. Every person is born to do a certain work. If you try to do some other person's work, you will be a failure. Great men and women never copy one another. A master mind cannot be made to fit a pattern or conform to a set routine. Every strong person's achievement is an outgrowth of their individual ideas. What you manufacture or sell, the conduct of your business, the book you write, the picture you paint, the sermon you preach, this is the expression to the world of what was wrapped up inside you, not in someone else. The imitator ruins their capacity for initiative. They lose their creative power. Their inventiveness and resourcefulness are never developed. Their executive ability, the ability to originate, to do things, is seriously crippled, if not utterly destroyed, by an effort to copy someone else. No human being ever yet made a success in trying to be somebody else, no matter how great or successful that person might be. Success cannot be successfully copied. It is original. It is self-expression. We are a failure just in proportion as we move away from ourselves. It is not the artist who can faithfully copy Raphael or Monet that will become famous, but the one who can paint a picture that was never before put on canvas. The artist who can express their ideal in their own tints and colors who can create something entirely new is the one that will become a master. Millions of people remain unsuccessful all their lives because they never dare to be themselves. They are afraid to take the initiative. They ruin their judgment by not using it, by depending upon others, running to them for advice and always following the track marked out by someone else. They are mere echoes, trailers. There are ten thousand who can follow, to one who can lead. It is the one who can step out of the crowd and do the unusual, the original, the individual thing that wins. The person who would succeed today in any marked way must be bold, self-reliant, inventive, original. The world makes way for those with a brilliant idea. They are wanted everywhere. There is little room for leaners, taggers, trailers. The world is looking as never before 
for the men and women with original force, who leave the beaten track and push into new fields. The future that is going to carry you to your goal is coiled up inside of you, in your energy, your pluck, your grit, your determination, your originality, your character. It does not exist in another, but lies within you at your command. The sooner you become disillusioned as to getting any great assistance outside of yourself and fall back upon your own inherent force, the better. It is a pitiable thing to go through the world borrowing other people's ideas, plans, methods, other people's judgment, running to this person and that for advice, never developing your own power, independence, self-reliance. Everywhere may be seen businesses weighed down with antiquated methods, ponderous record-keeping, out-of-date technology, because their owners cling to the old with fatal tenacity. The up-to-date business person is constantly breaking up old-time systems, which have been handed down from past generations. The progressive entrepreneur knows that the world is new every day, that it requires new treatment. They do not care how many people have done the work before, or in what way they have done it. They do their work in their own way. The present state of the world's progress is the result of a constant breaking away from the past, the elimination of outdated machinery, inefficient ideas, foolish superstition, prejudice and worn out methods. The individual who never believes that they can do a thing that never was done before, never will do it. You must eliminate can't from your dictionary, banish doubt from your vocabulary. Echoes, copies, imitations never can do anything. It is the aggressive, fearless, assertive, positive character that dares to step out from the crowd, make their own program, and carries it out regardless of what others may think or say, who wins. People who are made of the right kind of stuff do not make excuses, they work. They never whine, they keep forging ahead. They do not wait for somebody to help them, they help themselves. They do not wait for an opportunity, they make it. Those who complain of, quote, no chance, confess their weakness, their lack of efficiency. They show that they are not equal to the occasion, that they are not greater than the obstacle that confronts them. No chance has ever been the excuse of those who fail. Interview a great army of failures and most of them will tell you that they never had an opportunity like others, that there was no one to help them and that no one would give them a boost. They will tell you that the good places were all filled, that every occupation or profession was crowded, that there was no chance for them, that all the good opportunities were gone before they could seize them. After one of Alexander the Great's military campaigns, he was asked if he intended taking the next city if he had the opportunity. Opportunity, he exclaimed. I make my own opportunities. It is the men and women that make opportunities that are wanted everywhere. Remember that it is a dangerous thing to wait for opportunities until it becomes a habit. Energy and inclination for hard work ooze out in the waiting. Opportunity becomes invisible to those who are doing nothing or looking somewhere else for it. It is the great worker, the person who is alert for chances, that sees them. Some people become so opportunity blind that they cannot see chances anywhere. They would pass through a gold mine without noticing anything precious while others will find opportunities in the most barren and out-of-the-way places. While you are saying, there is no chance for me, and I can't, 
thousands of men and women in this country are tearing the words impossible and I can't out of their dictionaries. While you are thinking of the great things you would do if you only had a college education and a little more money to start with, others much less favored by fortune are annihilating these obstacles and forging ahead. Many of these men and women are not only starting without friends, money, influence, or any assistance, whatever, but are heavily handicapped by others depending upon them, or by some physical disability. Yet they are defying the fates which you say are keeping you back. Probably 9 out of 10 adults past middle life, if asked how it happens that they are today only barely earning a living, would tell you that they never had a chance that they were kept back, that circumstances were against them, that they had no opportunities such as other people around them had, or that they did not have the proper schooling, or else plead some similar excuse. The probabilities are that opportunity did visit every one of these men and women more than once in their youth or early adulthood but that they did not see that all good chances consisted in doing everything they undertook cheerfully, promptly, and just as well as it could be done. When young, they did not look upon every errand as a chance to be polite, prompt, and energetic, on every lesson in school as a foundation stone in their success structure. They did not think that the demoralizing hours of indolence and shiftlessness which they were weaving into the web of their lives would mar the fabric forever and reproach them through all time. They did not realize that the impudent reply to their employer, the carelessness and indifference which they slipped into their tasks, would come out as ghosts in the future to mar their happiness and success. Instead, they looked upon every duty shirked, the minutes they cut off from each end of the day, as so much gain. They did not realize that these things, which seem so innocent, would grow into giant defects which would mar their future success. They did not think that their slipshod methods, their careless attire, their aggressive manners, would lie as great bars across the path of their future success and keep them back from the goal of their ambitions. Millions of people are hunting for good chances and seem to think they have very little to do with the good opportunity themselves except to discover it. But no matter where you go, no matter who your ancestors were, what school or college you have attended, or who helps you, your best opportunity is within yourself. The help you get from others is something outside of you, while it is what you are, what you do yourself, that really counts. A habit of depending on oneself, a determination to find one's resources within oneself and not without, develops strength. There is no open door to the temple of success. Every person who enters forges their own key. They cannot effect an entrance for anyone else. Not even their own children can pass where they pass. The key that will unlock your great opportunity to you must be forged by you. No outside power, no help from influential friends or relations can fashion it. As a rule, the individual who unlocks the door of opportunity and makes their mark in the world fights their way up to their own achievements. What others do for them does not amount to much in comparison with what they do for themselves. The pampered person who is brought up in luxury and not obliged to work, whose strength is never called upon, rarely discovers what there is within themselves. However, you cannot keep an unpampered, determined, gritty individual from success. Put stumbling blocks in their way, and they turn them into stepping stones. 
take away their money, and they will make spurs of their poverty. If you are made of the stuff that wins, it does not matter whether you were born in a hovel or a mansion. You will find your opportunity or make it. You will not wait around for chance or luck to aid you. You will not think that you must have a complete set of the finest tools before you can attempt to do anything. The men and women who accomplished great things in the past did not wait for paraphernalia or fine tools. Those who are doing great things today did not wait for somebody or something to smooth the way and remove all difficulties before they began their work. They simply did the thing they set out to do with whatever tools they could get a hold of. No, it is not fine tools or splendid opportunities or influential friends or great riches that make great individuals. The greatness is in them or nowhere. The golden opportunity you are seeking is within yourself. It is not in your environment. It is not in luck or chance or the help of others. It is in yourself alone. If it is there, no one can keep you down. If it is not, no one can help you much. It is there, however, for the Creator has put the opportunity in every human being. But you must find for yourself the key that opens its door. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. For free transcripts, please visit livinghour.org. To get 30% off our Majesty program, please go to livinghour.org forward slash majesty and use the coupon code INSPIRATION. Thanks for listening. I look forward to talking with you next time. Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast. Are you looking for a way to kickstart the new year for greater success, better relationships, and more joy? Then check out the Living Hour's New Majesty Program, a powerful auto-suggestion meditation that has made a big difference in my own life. Learn more at livinghour.org forward slash majesty. Get 30% off your purchase by using the coupon code inspiration. Today's motivational reading was edited and adapted from the book Pushing to the Front by Orison Sweat Martin, published in 1894. The monster of worry dogs us from the cradle to the grave. There is no occasion so sacred but it is there. Unbidden, it comes to the wedding and the funeral alike. It is at every reception, every banquet. It occupies a seat at every table. No human mind can estimate the havoc and ruin wrought by worry. It has ever forced genius to do the work of mediocrity. It has caused more failures, more broken hearts, more blasted hopes than any other one cause since the dawn of the world. Did you ever hear of any good coming to any human being from worry? Did it ever help anybody to better their condition? Does it not always, everywhere, do just the opposite by impairing the health, exhausting the vitality, lessening efficiency? Think of the homes which it has broken up, the ambitions it has ruined, the hopes and prospects it has blighted. If there is any devil in existence, is it not worry with all its attendant progeny of evils? 
Yet in spite of all the tragic evils that follow in its wake, a visitor from another world would get the impression that worry is one of our dearest, most helpful friends. So closely do we hug it to ourselves, and so loath are we to part from it. Is it not strange that people, who know perfectly well that success and happiness both depend on keeping themselves in condition to get the most possible out of their energies, should harbor in their minds the enemy of this very success and happiness? Is it not strange that we should form this habit of anticipating evils that will probably never come, when we know that anxiety and fretting will not only rob us of peace and mind and strength and ability to do our work, but also of precious years of life. No person can utilize their normal power who dissipates their nervous energy in useless anxiety. Nothing will sap one's vitality and blight one's ambition nor detract from one's real power in the world more than the worrying habit. Work kills no one, but worry has killed vast multitudes. It is not the doing of things which injures us so much as the dreading to do them, not only performing them mentally over and over again, but anticipating something disagreeable in their performance. Worry not only saps vitality and wastes energy, but it also seriously affects the quality of one's work. It cuts down ability. We cannot put the highest quality of efficiency into our work when our mind is troubled. The mental faculties must have perfect freedom before they will give out their best. A troubled brain cannot think clearly, vigorously, and logically. The attention cannot be concentrated with anything like the same force when the brain cells are poisoned with anxiety as when they are fed by pure blood and are clean and unclouded. The blood of chronic worriers is vitiated with poisonous chemical substances and broken down tissues, according to Professor Elmer Gates and other noted scientists, who have shown that passions and harmful emotions cause actual chemical changes in the secretions and generate poisonous substances in the body which are fatal to healthy growth and action. One of the worst forms of worry is the brooding over failure. It blights the ambition, deadens the purpose, and defeats the very object the worrier has in view. Some people have the unfortunate habit of brooding over their past, castigating themselves for their shortcomings and mistakes, until their whole vision is turned backward instead of forward, and they see everything in a distorted light, because they are looking only on the shadow side. The longer the unfortunate picture which has caused trouble remains in the mind, the more thoroughly it becomes embedded there and the more difficult it is to remove it. Are we not convinced that every moment of worry detracts from our success capital and makes our failure more probable? That every bit of anxiety and fretfulness leaves its mark on the body, interrupts the harmony of our physical and mental well-being, and cripples efficiency, and that this condition is at war with our highest endeavor? Is it not strange that people will persist in allowing little worries, petty vexations, and unnecessary frictions to grind life away at such a fearful rate that old age stares them in the face in middle life? Look at the men and women who are shriveled and shrunken and aged at forty, not because of the hard work they have done or the real troubles they have had but because of habitual fretting, which has helped nobody, but has brought discord and unhappiness to their homes. I once read of a worrying woman who made a list of possible unfortunate events and happenings which she felt sure would come to pass 
and be disastrous to her happiness and welfare. The list was lost, and to her amazement when she recovered it, a long time afterwards, she found that not a single unfortunate prediction in the whole catalogue of disasters had been realized. Is not this a good suggestion for worriers? Write down everything which you think is going to turn out badly, and then put the list aside. You will be surprised to see what a small percentage of the doleful things ever come to pass. It is a pitiable thing to see vigorous men and women who have inherited godlike qualities and who bear the impress of divinity, wearing anxious faces and filled with all sorts of fear and uncertainty, worrying about yesterday, today, tomorrow, everything imaginable. Fear often runs like a baleful thread through the whole web of life from beginning to end. We are born into the atmosphere of fear and dread. We are afraid of our parents, afraid of our teachers, afraid of our playmates, afraid of ghosts, afraid of rules and regulations and punishments, afraid of the doctor, the dentist, the surgeon. Our adult life is a state of chronic anxiety which is fear in a milder form. We are afraid of failure in business, afraid of disappointments and mistakes, afraid of enemies, open or concealed, afraid of poverty, afraid of public opinion, afraid of accidents, of sickness, of death, and unhappiness after death. Humanity is like a haunted animal from the cradle to the grave, the victim of real or imaginary fears, not only our own, but those reflected upon us from the superstitions, self-deceptions, sensory illusions, false beliefs, and the concrete errors of the whole human race, past and present. Most of us are foolish children, afraid of our shadows, so handicapped in a thousand ways that we cannot get efficiency into our life work. A person who is filled with fear is not a real man, not a real woman. We are a puppet, a mannequin, an apology of an individual. Quit fearing things that may never happen, just as you would quit any bad practice which has caused you suffering. Fill your mind with courage, hope, and confidence. Do not wait until fear thoughts become entrenched in your mind and your imagination. Do not dwell upon them. Apply the antidote instantly, and the enemies will flee. There is no fear so great or entrenched so deeply in the mind that it cannot be neutralized or entirely eradicated by its opposite. You must drive out fear by putting a new idea into the mind. Fear in any of its expressions, like worry or anxiety, cannot live in an instant in your mind in the presence of the opposite thought. The image of courage, fearlessness, confidence, hope, self-assurance, self-reliance. Fear is a consciousness of weakness. It is only when you doubt your ability to cope with the thing you dread that fear is possible. Fear of disease, even, comes from a consciousness that you will not be able to successfully combat it. During an epidemic of a dreaded contagious disease, people who are especially susceptible and full of fear become panic-stricken through the cumulative effect of hearing the subject talked about and discussed on every hand and the vivid pictures which come from reading the newspapers. Their minds become full of images of the disease, of its symptoms and of death, mourning and funerals. If you ever accomplish anything else in life, get rid of worry. There are no greater enemies of harmony than little anxieties and petty cares. It is the little pinpricks the petty annoyances of our everyday life that mar our comfort and happiness and rob us of more strength than the great troubles which we nerve ourselves to meet. 
It is the perpetual scolding and fault-finding of an irritable man or woman which ruins the entire peace and happiness of many a home. The most deplorable waste of energy in human life is caused by the fatal habit of anticipating evil, of fearing what the future has in store for us, and under no circumstances can the fear or worry be justified by the situation, for it is always an imaginary one, utterly groundless and without foundation. What we fear is invariably something that has not yet happened. It does not exist. Hence, it is not a reality. The fear habit shortens life, for it impairs all the physiological processes. Its power is shown by the fact that it actually changes the chemical composition of certain cells in the body. Fear victims not only age prematurely, but they also die prematurely. All work done when one is suffering from a sense of fear or foreboding has little efficiency. Fear strangles originality, daring, boldness. It kills individuality and weakens all the mental processes. Great things are never done under a sense of fear of some impending danger. What a slaughterer of years, what a sacrificer of happiness and ambitions, what a destroyer of careers this monster has been. Fear depresses normal mental action and renders one incapable of acting wisely in an emergency, for no one can think clearly and act wisely when paralyzed by fear. When we become melancholy and discouraged about our affairs, when we are filled with fear that we are going to fail, and are haunted by the specter of poverty and a suffering family, before we realize it, we attract the very thing we dread, and the prosperity is crushed out of our work or business. But we are a mental failure first. If instead of giving up to our fear, we would persist in keeping prosperity in our mind, assume a hopeful, optimistic attitude, and would conduct our business in a systematic, economical, far-sighted manner, actual failure would be comparatively rare. But when we become discouraged, when we lose heart and grip and become panic-stricken and a victim of worry, we are not in a position to make the effort which is absolutely necessary to bring victory, and there is a stumbling all along the line. There is not a single redeeming feature about worry or any of its numerous progeny. It is always, everywhere, an unmitigated curse. Although there is no reality in fear, no truth behind it, yet everywhere we see people who are slaves to this monster of the imagination. Let's work on slaying this monster today. Let's get started now. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. For free transcripts, please go to livinghour.org. If you would like to support our podcast and the work we do, you can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month. To become a patron, please go to patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com. And do a quick search for the Inspirational Living Podcast. Thanks for listening. I look forward to talking with you next time. Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast, brought to you in part by Book of Zen makers of inspirational fashion and gift ideas. Visit them online at bookofzen.com. Today's podcast has been edited and adapted from Love's Way by Orson Sweat Martin, published in 1918.
with those of us who are living in conflicts of any kind, would only try love's way, even for a short time, we never could be induced to go back to the old way of living. We could never again be satisfied with the old scolding, jealous, anxious, fault-finding, slave-driving, worrying ways. Why not try the experiment? You who have been tortured and torn to pieces for years with hot tempers, with worry, with fear, with hatred and ill will. You who have already wasted many years of your life. Why not turn your back on all this and try love's way? You whose home life has been a bitter disappointment, you husbands and wives who have quarreled, who have never known what peace and comfort are, give love's way a trial. It will not disappoint you. Love will smooth out all your wrinkles. It will put a new spirit into your home that was never there before. It will bring a new light into your eyes, new hope and new joy into your heart. You whose lives have been lonely and barren, who perhaps have soured on life, you doubters, you skeptics, you pessimists, you who have tried the selfish way, the greedy way, who have sought only your own happiness, you who have tried the fretting way, the worrying way, you whose lives are filled with fear and jealousy and all sorts of discords, why not try love's way? All the other ways than love have failed to bring you happiness. The selfish way always will fail because it is not in harmony with the eternal principles of life. Love's way is. It harmonizes with all that is real all that is true and beautiful, and it always works. It will unravel all your snarls and solve all your problems. There is a better way for all you who so far have found life a bitter disappointment. There is a better way for all who bear the scars and strains of strife, who have been battered and blighted by the old way, in which there has been no rest no harmony, no sweetness. It is love's way. Try it for every trouble, for every hurt and sorrow, for every difficult problem that confronts you. You parents who have worn yourselves to a frazzle and prematurely aged yourselves in trying to bring up your children by scolding, nagging, punishing, driving, why not try love's way instead? You can love your boys and girls into obedience and respect much more quickly and with far better results to them and to yourself than by driving them. Appeal to their best and noblest instincts instead of their worst, and you will be surprised to see how quickly and readily they will respond to your appeal. There is something in human nature which protests against being driven or forced if you have been trying to force your boys and girls in the past, give it up and try the new way, love's way. See if it does not work wonders in your home. See if it will not make your domestic machinery run much more smoothly. See if it will not wonderfully relieve the strain upon yourself. Give love's way a trial. Forced work, forced obedience, never brings the best results. I know a man who is so worked up all the time by trying to regulate everybody and everything to his individual pattern, to bring everybody to his way of thinking and to do things just as he does them, that there is no living in peace with him. His children fairly dread his homecoming. No matter what they are doing, it is wrong. He is sure to scold them for something they did or did not do. He makes himself and everybody else in the home miserable by his narrowness and his domineering spirit. The same thing is true in his business. Nothing suits him. He is always grumbling, finding fault, nagging, 
discouraging his employees. He doesn't know that a little bit of encouragement and praise when they do well would accomplish infinitely more than all his scolding, fretting, stewing, and fault-finding, to which they have become so accustomed that it has no effect other than to disgust and make them uncomfortable. The habit of trying to control people, bossing them, trying to make them do things our way, the habit of keeping everlastingly after our children with don'ts and shots and musts, trying to force our life partner, our associates, our employees to do things according to our ideas, the habit of contradicting and calling people down, of trying to regulate everybody and get all into line is destructive of all mental harmony. It saps your energies, injures your disposition, and antagonizes all who come in contact with you. Love's way is the very opposite of this. It is broad and generous, just, magnanimous. It respects the rights and feelings of others. Love does not try to correct defects, to change undesirable qualities or tendencies by continually calling attention to them and finding fault. It simply neutralizes them. Love drives those defects and bad qualities out of the nature, just as the sun drives the darkness out of a room when the shutters are flung open. If there is discord in your home, you will be delighted to find how quickly love's way will drive out the darkness and let in the light of harmony. It will change the atmosphere in your family as if by magic. It will bring a new spirit into your home and soon helpful relations will take the place of antagonistic ones. Let sympathy and kindness take the place of scolding and nagging and you will work a revolution in your household. Generous, wholehearted, unstinted praise now and then will act like lubricating oil on dry, squeaky machinery, and its reflex action on yourself will be magical. You business owners who have never been able to get good help, who are driven to desperation by the actions of your employees, you who have suffered torture in your struggle with dishonesty and inefficiency, whose faces are furrowed with cruel wrinkles and prematurely aged in trying to fight evil with evil. Try love's way. Try it, all you who are worn out with the discord and the hagglings, the trials and tribulations you encounter every day in your business. It will create a new spirit in your store, your factory, your office. Whatever your business, Whatever your trials and difficulties, love will ease the jolts of life and smooth your way miraculously. Try love's way, all you who have hitherto lived in purgatory because you did not know this better way. Near Grant's tomb in New York, on the bluffs overlooking the Hudson, is a little marble monument over a century old. It was erected to a little four-year-old boy who was so genial and lovable that everybody who knew him loved him, and it bears this simple inscription, an amiable child. This is the whole story of the little life, which must have been a beautiful illustration of love's way, for love is always amiable. Love's way includes everything that is beautiful everything that is kind and good and clean and true, everything that is worth having. It carries no regrets. It never leaves us sorry. It is pure as the life of a little child. There is always an amen of the soul to all its acts. Try love's way. It holds the great secret of happiness. Life without love is valueless. I once read a story of a sunbeam that had heard there were places on the earth so horrible, so dark, dismal, and gloomy that it was impossible to describe them. 
The Sunbeam resolved to find these places and started on its journey with lightning speed. It visited the caverns of the earth. It glided into sunless homes, into dark alleys, into underground cellars. It wandered everywhere in its quest to see what the darkness was like. But the sunbeam never found the darkness, because wherever it went, it carried its own light with it. Every spot it visited, no matter how dark and dismal before its entry, was brightened and cheered by its presence. The sun is a beautiful symbol of love. It sends its cheering, life-giving ray into the wretched hovel, into the prison cell, as impartially as into the palace. It gives itself as generously, as joyously to the worst criminal, to the poorest soul who walks the earth, as to the monarch on their throne. It shines upon the just and the unjust alike. It does not ask whose corn, whose potatoes, whose roses, whose homes it shall shine upon. It asks no question about Earth's races, about our principles, our politics, our religious beliefs or convictions. It shines upon good and bad, upon believer and unbeliever, upon all nationalities, all races. Like the sun, love irradiates and warms into life all that it touches. It is to the human heart what the sun is to the rose. It brings out all the fragrance and beauty, all the color and richness, all the possibilities enfolded in it. Love brings out all that is best in us because it appeals to the noblest sentiments, the loftiest ideals. True love elevates, purifies, and strengthens every heart it touches. It lifts us above ourselves because it sees only the best in us. It looks back of weakness, back of criminality, back of our deficient image of ourselves, back of our conviction of our weakness, of our inferiority, and sees the divine that is within us, waiting to be called out. It unlocks our nature and releases wonderful powers which have been buried so deep that we were unconscious of them. Love sees God in the worst human ruin. It gives everybody a chance. No human being has ever forfeited the chance to try again. When nothing else is left, when life is full of bitterness and anguish, the thief, the murderer, the failure, the outcast, turns to love and finds a refuge, for, quote, love never faileth. Love's delight is in helping the unfortunate and raising the fallen. When troubles come and fair-weather friends have deserted you, when your business is ruined, when you have made fatal mistakes and society has closed its doors on you, when everybody else rejects and denounces you, when everything else has failed, then love comes and stands by you, tends to your wounds, and helps you get on your feet again. No power can resist the love force. Nothing can destroy it. Poverty cannot stifle it. Neglect cannot weaken it. Disgrace cannot kill it. Ingratitude cannot quench its flame in the mother's heart. Love overcomes fear because it is the antidote of fear. It is the only power that can conquer this, the greatest human curse, which has caused humankind more suffering than any other one thing. Love blesses where others curse, remembers where others forget, forgives where others condemn, gives where others withhold. Love takes the sting from disappointments and sorrow. It breathes music into the voice, into the footsteps. It gives worth and beauty to the commonest office. It surrounds home with an atmosphere of moral health. It gives power to effort and wings to progress. It is omnipotent. The only thing which makes life endurable, 
which takes the drudgery out of the work, the suffering out of the pain, the deprivation out of poverty, is love. There is no other experience in our lives that ever gives the satisfaction, the joy that comes from loving and being loved in return. Love's happiness lies in making others happy. Love was born a twin and cannot be happy alone. It must share everything it has with others. It is never selfish, never envious, never grasping or greedy. In business, love always takes account of the person at the other end of the bargain. It is always fair and just, and never takes advantage of or injures another. Love is always generous, helpful, kind. What greater happiness can there be than giving happiness to those who appreciate it, those who love us and are devoted to us? The human heart was made for love, and everyone can draw to themselves as much as they send out. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. For free transcripts of our podcast, please go to livinghour.org. If you enjoy our podcast, please consider becoming a patron. You can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month, which will ensure that we can continue our podcast for years to come. To become a patron, please visit patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com. Simply do a quick search for the Inspirational Living Podcast at patreon.com to find our Patreon page and learn more, including the free gifts we offer to every patron. Subscribe to our free podcast today at the iTunes Store, or at Google Play, or at stitcher.com. Thank you for listening. We look forward to being with you next time. Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast. If you value our podcast and would like to help support us with a one-time donation this holiday season, please visit livinghour.org forward slash donate. Your donations are greatly appreciated and will help ensure the continued production of our podcast. Thank you. Today's reading was edited and adapted from Self-Investment by Orison Sweat Marnin, published in 1911. It does not matter whether you want to be a public speaker or not. A person should have such complete control of themselves, should be so self-reliant and self-poised that they can get up in front of any audience no matter how large or formidable, and express their thoughts clearly and distinctly. Self-expression in some manner is the only means of developing mental power. It may be in music, it may be on canvas, it may be through oratory, it may come through selling goods or writing a book, but it must come through self-expression. Self-expression in any legitimate form tends to call out what is in us, our resourcefulness and inventiveness. But no other form of self-expression develops us so thoroughly and so effectively and so quickly unfolds all of our powers as speaking before an audience. It is doubtful whether anyone can reach the highest standard of culture without studying the art of expression, especially public vocal expression. In all ages, public speaking has been regarded as the highest expression of human achievement. Young people, no matter what they intend to be, whether mechanic or farmer, merchant or physician, should make it a study. 
nothing else will call out what is in us so quickly and so effectively as the constant effort to do our best in speaking before an audience. When we undertake to think on our feet and speak extemporaneously before the public, the power and the skill of the entire individual are put to a severe test. The practice of public speaking, the effort to marshal all one's forces in a logical and forceful manner, to bring to a focus all the power one possesses, is a great awakener of all the faculties. The sense of power that comes from holding the attention, stirring the emotions, or convincing the reason of an audience, gives self-confidence, assurance, self-reliance, arouses ambition, and tends to make one more effective in every way. One's judgment, education, character, all the things that go to make a person what they are, is being unrolled like a panorama in your effort to express yourself. Every mental faculty is quickened, every power of thought and expression stirred and spurred. When you are a speaker, you summon all your reserves of experience, of knowledge, of natural or acquired ability, and mass all your forces in the endeavor to express yourself with power, and to capture the approval and applause of your audience. On the other hand, when you are a writer, you have the advantage of being able to wait on your moods. You can write when you feel like it, and you know that you can burn your manuscript again and again if it does not please you. There are not a thousand eyes upon you. You do not have a great audience criticizing every sentence, weighing every thought. You don't have to step on the scales of every listener's judgment to be weighed, as the public speaker does. Instead, you may write as listlessly as you please. Use much or little of your brain or energy, just as you choose or feel like doing. No one is watching you. Your pride and vanity are not touched. And what you write may never be seen by anyone. And also, there is always a chance of revision. In music, whether vocal or instrumental, what you give out is only partially your own. The rest is the composer's. In conversation, you do not feel that so much depends upon your words. Only a few persons hear them, and perhaps no one will ever think of them again. But when you attempt to speak before an audience, all props are knocked out from under you. You have nothing to lean upon. You can get no assistance, no advice. You must find all your resources in yourself. You stand absolutely alone. There is no class of people put to such a severe test of showing what is in them as public speakers. No other people who run such a risk of exposing their weak spots or making fools of themselves in the estimation of others, as do the speech givers. You may have millions of dollars, broad acres of land, and you may live in a palace, but none of these will avail you now. Your memory, your experience, your education, your ability are all you have. You will be measured by what you say, what you reveal of yourself in your speech. You will stand or fall in the estimation of your audience. Anyone who lays any claim to culture should train themselves to think on their feet so that they can, at a moment's notice, rise and express themselves intelligently. And yet we all know successful men and women who are not able to stand on their feet in public, even to make a few remarks, without trembling like an aspen leaf. They had plenty of opportunities when they were young, at school or in debating clubs, 
to get rid of their self-consciousness and to acquire ease and facility in public speaking. But they always shrank from every opportunity because they were timid or felt that somebody else could handle the debate or questions better. There are plenty of business people today who would give a great deal of money if they could only go back and improve the early opportunities for learning to think and speak on their feet which they threw away. Now they have money, they have position, but they are nobodies when called upon to speak in public. All they can do is look foolish, blush, stammer out an apology, and sit down. The effort to express one's ideas in lucid, clean-cut, concise, telling English tends to make one's everyday language choicer and more direct and to improve one's diction generally. In this and other ways, speech-making develops mental power and character. This explains the rapidity with which young people develop in school or college when they begin to take part in public debates or in debating societies. Every individual, says Lord Chesterfield, may choose good words instead of bad ones and speak properly instead of improperly. We all may have grace in our emotions and gestures and may be a very agreeable instead of disagreeable speaker if we will but take the time and care to become so. In thinking on your feet before an audience, you must think quickly, vigorously, effectively. At the same time, you must speak through a properly modulated voice, with proper facial and bodily expressions and gestures. This requires practice. Nothing will tire an audience more quickly than monotony, everything expressed on the same dead level. There must be variety. The human mind tires very quickly when this is not supplied. This is especially true of a monotonous tone. It is a great art to be able to raise and lower the voice with sweet flowing cadences which please the ear. As William Gladstone once said, 99 people in every hundred never rise above mediocrity because the training of the voice is entirely neglected and considered of no importance. Public speaking, thinking on one's feet, is a powerful educator except to the thick-skinned person, the one who has no sensitivity or who does not care for what others think of them. Nothing else so thoroughly discloses your weaknesses, or shows up your limitations of thought, your poverty of speech, your narrow vocabulary. Nothing else is such a touchstone of character, and the extent of one's reading, the carefulness or carelessness of your observation as your public utterances. You must be careful to secure a good vocabulary by good reading and a dictionary. You must know words. The close, compact statement is imperative. Learn to stop when you get through. Do not keep stringing out conversation or argument after you have made your point. You only neutralize the good impression you have made weaken your case, and prejudice people against you for your lack of tact, good judgment, or sense of proportion. It is so easy and tempting, especially for students in school or college, to shrink from public debates or speaking on the grounds that they are not quite well enough educated at present. They want to wait until they can use a little better grammar until they have read more history and more literature, until they have gained a little more culture and ease of manner. But the way to acquire grace, ease, facility, the way to get poise and balance so that you will not feel disturbed in public gatherings, is to get the experience. 
do the thing so many times that it will become second nature to you. If you have an invitation to speak, no matter how much you may shrink from it, or how timid or shy you may be, resolve that you will not let this opportunity for self-engagement slip by you. Even if you fail on the platform, it will have good results, for it often arouses a determination to conquer the next time. It is not the speech, but the person behind the speech, that wins the way to the front. One individual carries weight because they are themselves the embodiment of power. They are themselves convinced of what they say. There is nothing of the negative, the doubtful, the uncertain in their nature. They not only know a thing, but they know that they know it. Their opinion carries with it the entire weight of their being. Lastly, remember that you must be sincere. The public is very quick to see through shams. If the audience sees a furtive eye, that you are not honest, that you are acting, they will not take any stock in you. It is not enough to say a pleasing thing, an interesting thing. You must be able to convince. And to convince others, you must have strong convictions, born from a strong character. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. Transform your life in 30 days with our Majesty Meditation Program. Get 30% off the $11.99 purchase price with the coupon code INSPIRATION. Learn more at livinghour.org forward slash majesty. Thanks for listening. I look forward to talking with you next time. Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast, brought to you in part by Book of Zen, makers of wearable inspiration for a better world. Today's podcast has been edited and adapted from The Victorious Attitude by Orson Sweat Martin, published in 1916. Whatever an individual concentrates upon, they tend to get because concentration is just as much a force as electricity. The young person who concentrates upon law, thinks law, dreams law, reads everything they can get a hold of relating to law, who steals into courtrooms and listens to trials every chance they get, is sure to become a lawyer or judge. It is the same with any other vocation, medicine, engineering, literature, music, any of the arts or sciences. Those who concentrate upon an idea, who continue to visualize their dreams, to nurse them, who never lose sight of their goal, no matter how dark or forbidding the way, get what they concentrate on. They make their minds powerful magnets to attract the thing on which they have concentrated. Sooner or later, they realize their dreams. What could have kept Beethoven from becoming a master musician? What could have kept Thomas Edison or Steve Jobs, whom no hardships frightened, from realizing their wonderful visions? If you can concentrate your thought and hold it persistently, work with it along the line of your greatest ambition, nothing can keep you from its realization. But spasmodic concentration, spasmodic enthusiasm, however intense, will eventually peter out. Dreaming without effort will only waste your power. It is holding your vision, together with persistent, concentrated endeavor on the material plane, that wins. 
There are thousands of devices in the patent office in Washington, D.C., which have never been of any use to the world, simply because the inventors did not cling to their vision long enough to materialize it to perfection. They became discouraged. They ceased their efforts. They let their visions fade, and so became demagnetized and lost the power to realize them. Other inventors have taken up many such near successes, added the missing links to their completion, and have made them real successes. Everywhere there are disappointed men and women who have soured on life because they could not get what they longed for, be it a musical or art education, the necessary training for law or medicine, for engineering, or for some other vocation to which they felt they had been called. They struggle along in an uncongenial environment, railing at the fate which has robbed them of their own. They feel that life has cheated them, when the truth is, they have cheated themselves. They did not insistently and persistently send out their desires and longings. They did not nurse them and positively refuse to give up on them. Above all, they did not put forth their best efforts for their realization. Three things we must do to make our dreams come true. Visualize our desire, concentrate on our vision, and work to bring it into reality. The implements necessary for this are inside us, not outside. No matter what the accidents of birth or fortune, there is only one force by which we can fashion our life material. Mind. Consider the bee and the snake. They draw material from the same plant. The one transmutes it into a deadly poison, the other into delicious honey. The power that changes the stuff into a new substance is within the bee and snake. Or consider two sailors who force the same breeze to send their boats in opposite directions. It is not the wind, but the set of the sail that determines the port of call. The power that makes our desire, our vision, a reality is not in our environment or in any condition outside of us. It is within us. There is some unseen, unknown, magnetic force developed by a long-continued concentration of the mind on a cherished desire that draws to itself the reality which matches the desire. We cannot tell just what this force is that brings the thing we long for out of the cosmic ether and objectifies it, shapes it to the form corresponding with our longing. We only know that it exists. The cosmic ether everywhere surrounding us is full of undreamed potencies. And the strong, concentrated mind reaches out into this ether, this sea of intelligence, attracts to it its own, and objectifies the desire. All human achievements have been pulled out of the unseen world by the brain, through the mind reaching out and fashioning the wealth of material at its disposal into the shapes which matched the wishes, the desires, of the achievers. All the great discoveries, great inventions, great deeds that have lifted us up from our animal existence have been wrought out by the perpetual thinking of and visualizing of these things by their authors. These grand characters clung to their visions, nursed them until they became mighty magnets that attracted out of the universal intelligence the realization of their dreams. No matter your current condition in life, no matter the hardships with which you have to deal, don't let go of your desire and dreams. Whether it be music, art, literature, business, or a profession, hold on to it. No matter how dark the outlook, keep on visualizing your desire and light, and opportunity will come to enable you to make it a reality. Whatever the world has fitted you to do, it will give you a chance to do, if you but cling to your vision and struggle as best you can for its attainment. Most of us, instead of treating our desires seriously, trifle with them as though they were only to be played with, as though they never could become realities. We do not believe in their divinity. We regard our heart longings, our soul yearnings, as fanciful vagaries, romances of the imagination. 
Yet we know that every invention, every discovery or achievement that has blessed the world began in a desire, in a longing to produce or to do a certain thing, and that the persistent longing was accompanied by a struggle to make the mental picture a reality. It is difficult for us to grasp the fact that ambition, accompanied by effort, is actually a creative power which tends to realize itself. Only the things that we see seem real to us, when as a matter of fact, the most real things in the world are the unseen. We never doubt the existence of the force that brings the bud out of the seed, the foliage and the flower out of the bud, and the fruits and the vegetables from the flower. It is invisible. We cannot sense it but we know that it is mightier than anything we see. No one can see or hear or feel gravitation, or the forces which balance the earth and whirl it with lightning speed through space, bringing it round its orbit without a variation of a tenth of a second in a century. Yet who can doubt their reality? Does anyone question the power of electricity because it cannot be seen or heard or smelled? The potency of our desires, of our soul longings, when backed by the effort to make them realities, is just as real as that of any of the unseen forces in nature's great laboratory. The great cosmic ether is packed with invisible potentialities. Whatever comes out of it to you, comes in response to your call. Everything you have accomplished in life has been a result of a psychic law which consciously or unconsciously, you have obeyed. Do not make the mistake of thinking that the way will not open because you cannot now see any possible means of achieving that for which you long. The very intensity of your longing for a certain career, to do a certain thing, is the best evidence that you have the ability to match it, and that this ability was given to you for a purpose, so that you might play a divine and magnificent part in the great universal plan. The longing is merely the forerunner of achievement. It is the seed that will germinate if nurtured by effort. If, however, you stop sowing the seed, you will get just about as much harvest as a farmer would get if he should sow his seeds without preparing the soil, without fertilizing or cultivating it, or keeping down the weeds. It is the blending of the practical with the ideal that brings the harvest from the seeds of thought. You must keep on struggling toward your ideal. No matter how black and forbidding the way ahead of you, just imagine that you are carrying a lantern which will advance with you and give light enough for the next step. It is not necessary to see the end of the road. All the light you need is for the next step. Faith in your vision and persistent endeavor will do the rest. There is no doubt that if we do our part, the divinity that has created us, that has given us an appointed place and vocation within the plan of the universe, will bring things out better than we can plan or even imagine. Send out your wishes, cherish your desires, force out your yearnings, your heart longings, with all the intensity and persistency you can muster and you will be surprised to see how soon they will begin to attract their affinities, how they will grow and take a tangible shape and ultimately become actual things. Fling out your desires into the cosmic ether boldly with the utmost confidence. Therein you will gather the material which shall build into reality the castle of your dreams. The trouble with us is that we are afraid to do this we fear that fate will mock us, cast back to us our mental visions empty of fruition. We do not understand the laws governing our thought forces any more than we understand the laws governing the universe. If we had faith in their power, our earnest thoughts and efforts would germinate in bud and flower, just as does the tiny seed we put into the ground. There is no human being who doesn't have some sort of chance. If your present position cramps you, if it does not give you the room to express yourself, you can make room by filling it to overflowing, by doing your work as well as it can be done, 
by keeping your mind steadfastly fixed on the ladder of your ascent. In your mind you make the stairs by which you ascend or descend. Nobody else can do it for you. The master key which will unlock that cruel door that keeps you back is not in the hand of fate. You are fashioning it by your thoughts. Your next step is right where you are in the thing you are doing today. The door to something better is always in the duty of the moment. The spirit in which you do your work, the energy which you throw into it, the determination with which you back up your ambition. These, no matter what opposes you, are the forces that unlock the door to something better. If you hold to your vision and are honest, earnest, and true, there is nothing that can stand in the way of its realization. When we first start out in life, we are enthusiasts. Our vision is bright and alluring, and we feel confident we are going to win, that we shall do something distinctive, something individual, unusual. But after a few setbacks and failures, we lose heart, and faith in our vision dies. Then we gradually awaken to the fact that our ambition is beginning to deteriorate. It is not quite as sharply defined as formerly. Our ideals are a trifle dimmed our longings a trifle less insistent. We try to find reasons and excuses for our lagging efforts and waning enthusiasm. We think it may be due to overwork, because we are tired and need a rest, or because our health is not quite up to standard, and that by and by our former intense desire to realize our dreams will return. But the whole process is so insidious that before we realize it, our fires, for lack of fuel, are quite burned out. Our grip on our vision was not strong enough. We did not half understand its mighty power when firmly and persistently kept in mind to help us achieve our goal. What we get out of life depends very largely on fidelity to our visions. If we truly believe in them, we will not let them die for lack of nursing. If we really have the ability to match them, and are not self-deceived by egotism, petty vanity, and conceit. No misfortunes, no failure of plans, no discouragements, no obstacles, nothing in the world can separate us from them. We will cling to them to our dying day. Never mind what discouragements, misfortunes, or failures come to you. Let nobody, no combination of unfortunate circumstances, destroy your faith in your dream of what you believe you were made to do. Never mind how the actual facts seem to contradict the results you are after. No matter who may oppose you or how much others may abuse and condemn you, cling to your vision because it is sacred. It is the God urge within you. You have no right to allow it to fade or to become dim. Your final success will be measured by your ability to cling to your vision through discouragement. It will depend largely upon your stick to your bulldog tenacity. If you shrink before criticism and opposition, you will demagnetize your mind and lose all the momentum which you have gained in your previous endeavors. No matter how black or threatening the outlook, keep working, keep visualizing your life's dream, and some unexpected way will surely open for its fulfillment. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of livinghour.org. If you enjoy our podcast, please consider becoming a patron. You can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month, which will ensure that we can continue our podcast for years to come. To become a patron, please visit patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com. Simply do a quick search for the Inspirational Living Podcast at patreon.com to find our Patreon page and learn more, including the free gifts we offer to every patron. Subscribe to our free podcast today at the iTunes Store or at stitcher.com. For free transcripts of our podcast, please visit us online at podcast.livinghour.org. Thank you for listening. We look forward to being with you next time.
Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast, brought to you in part by Book of Zen, makers of wearable inspiration for a better world. Today's podcast has been edited and adapted from the book The Optimistic Life by Orson Sweat Martin, published in 1907. When writer Edith Wyatt was a student at Bryn Mawr College, she was known as the girl in the cheering up business. Homesick students, discouraged students, students who were behind in their studies, weary students, went to her for a bit of brightness and encouragement, and always found it. She radiated metal sunshine from every pore. There is a great opening in the cheering up business, plenty of room for everybody and it does not interfere with any other calling. One may do more good in it than in one's regular vocation. Somehow these cheerful people have the power of unlocking the faculties, loosening the tongue, to make us speak with the gift of prophecy. These sunshine characters are health promoters. They are the unpaid boards of health who look after the public welfare. The faculty of humor was given us to be developed, as much as the faculty for earning a living. The universality of fun-loving shows its importance. It is as much our duty to develop the mirth-loving faculty as the mathematical faculty or language. There is every evidence that the fun-loving faculty was intended to be the strongest in human nature instead of the weakest. It ought to be developed and stimulated. It is the great medicine of the mind, the great uplifter and lubricator. It is wonderful how the cultivation of the habit of enjoying things will transform the whole life so that we see everything in a different light. This does not suggest frivolity or flippancy, but the normal natural development of humor. Great healthy natures are always fun-loving. It is positively sinful to suppress the mirthful tendencies in young people who should be bubbling over joyous and happy and zolting in mere existence. A serious and sober face on a child should be unthinkable. It is incompatible with God's plan. What has care and anxiety to do with a young life? Care and anxiety and worry in a young face show that somebody is at fault. Laugh until I come back was the goodbye often used by the famous American minister Edward Taylor. Yet many people today have ruined their ability to laugh. They have no rebound, no elasticity. To them, a sense of humor is a weakness, frivolous and inconsistent with the dead in earnest, sober life. Life is a thing to be taken seriously, they say. These people feel the weight of the woes of the world. They are loaded down with this responsibility. They cannot understand how anybody can take such a light, flippant view of life as to spend time in fun-making. These people give us the impression that the whole universe would stop were it not for them. They go around with a serious, aggrieved air, with the world resting upon their shoulders. Joyous people are not only the happiest, but the longest lived, the most useful, and the most successful. A sense of humor, the love of fun in human nature, is a normal, natural lubricant which oils life's machinery, makes it run smoothly, and relieves that grinding of the bearings which prematurely wears away so many lives. The 19th century woman's activist Lydia Marie Child used to say, I think cheerfulness in every possible way. I hang prisms in my windows to fill the room with rainbows. This is the right kind of philosophy, the great medicine of the mind, the best tonic for the body. The habit of looking on the sunny side, the laughter side, or ludicrous side of things, is a fortune in itself. I would rather be a millionaire of cheerfulness and sunshine than of dollars. No matter what your work may be, learn to find happiness everywhere. The love of cheerfulness can be cultivated like any other faculty, and in practical life, it will be worth more to you than a college education without it. This is a wealth that all can accumulate, the wealth of joy. No matter how hard your lot, how dark the day may seem, 
If you work a little good humor into it, it will lift your life above a humdrum existence. If you manage to get in a good laugh during the day, your work will not seem nearly as hard. It will relieve the grind and dreariness. A dull, serious mood all day will not only make you very uninteresting to others, it will make your own load heavier. A good laugh does away with cares, worries, doubts, and relieves the great strain of modern life. If there is anyone who bores us, it is the man or woman who has no fun in them, who can never see a joke, who has no such sense of the ludicrous as to find something to excite laughter every hour of every day. Better to have a mind too small than one too serious. Give us the joy which is independent of circumstances, and which lifts us above even an oppressive environment. Smile once in a while. It will make your heart seem lighter. Life's a mirror. If we smile, smiles come back to greet us. If we're frowning all the while, frowns forever meet us. You are on the shady side of seventy, I expect, someone said to an old gentleman. No, I am on the sunny side of it, he replied. A successful business owner was once asked why he did not care for the services of workers over fifty. He replied, it is not because they cannot do the work, but they take themselves too seriously. One would think that there was a law against laughter in many workplaces today, where scarcely a bright cheerful face radiating sunshine is found. Even during lunch breaks, business people cannot forget the serious side of life. They eat with long faces. They are thinking, thinking, worrying, worrying, planning, planning. The almighty dollar is a serious subject, forbidding laughter during business hours. And yet, the pessimist repels trade in new business. The cheerful individual attracts it. There is a great drawing power in optimism. The hopeful person sees success where others see failure, sunshine where others see shadows and storm. If our children were only brought up with the idea that the principal thing in life is to be cheerful under all circumstances, it would soon revolutionize our civilization. A great many people never learn to laugh heartily. A sort of half smile is as far as they ever get. If children get a little boisterous, they are hushed. Their little lives are suppressed in sad, serious homes until they almost lose the power of spontaneous laughter. One of the redeeming features of silly comedies and TV sitcoms is that people, temporarily at least, forget the serious side of life and learn to laugh. How glad we all are to welcome a sunny soul. We are never too busy to see them. There is nothing we welcome so much as sunshine. It is a priceless gift to be able to possess a calm, serene, sweet soul which soothes and enriches, for it is a perpetual balm to the hurts of the world. These souls reassure us. We seem to touch power and sympathy when they are with us, and we love to go near them when in trouble. They breathe the medicinal balm that soothes the wounds and hurts of the heart. There is one success that is equally open to all men and women, regardless of their background, race, or education. That is to go through life with a smiling face, and to scatter the flowers of kindness on every hand. The habit of feeling kindly towards everybody, of carrying about a helpful manner, an expression of love, of kindness in one's very face, and a desire to help and cheer, is worth a fortune to young and old alike. The wearer of smiles and the bearer of a kindly disposition needs no introduction, but is welcome everywhere. There is nothing wanted so much in the world as sunshine, and the greatest wealth is a cheerful, helpful disposition. These are riches which not only bless the possessor, everybody they come in contact with partakes of their wealth. Everybody is rich who knows or comes in contact with the millionaire of good cheer, and the more they give of their wealth, the more it multiplies. It is like the seed put into the soil. The more one sows, the greater the harvest.
The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. For free transcripts of our podcasts, visit us online at livinghour.org. Today's podcast was sponsored in part by autosuggestion.io. Transform your life in 30 days. Discover the autosuggestion sound method at autosuggestion.io. And by Book of Zen, makers of wearable inspiration and motivational gifts. Visit them online at bookofzen.com. Subscribe to the Inspirational Living Podcast by looking us up in the iTunes Store. If you're using an Android phone, download the Stitcher app and you'll find us on there. We deliver new podcasts twice a week, every Tuesday and Thursday. Thanks for joining us. I look forward to talking to you next time. Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast, brought to you today by Etitude, makers of the world's first organic bamboo lyocell bedding. Try out their heavenly soft bamboo bedding for 100 days risk-free. Get 10% off your purchase by using the special coupon code INSPIRATION. Visit them online at etitude.com. That's E-T-T-I-T-U-D-E dot com. Discover what it feels like to sleep on a cloud. Today's podcast has been edited and adapted from the book, The Victorious Attitude, by Dr. Orison Sweat Martin, published in 1916. Would you not think yourself fortunate to have an assistant of great ability, who is available free of charge, day and night, and so susceptible to instructions that even your slightest mental suggestion would be faithfully carried out? If you had such an assistant, and knew that in spite of their great ability, they would be able to do what you suggested only in proportion to your belief in their power to do so, would you not be careful to entertain no doubts of their ability to carry out your wishes or suggestions? Now, just substitute for this personal assistant your subconscious self, that part of you which is below the threshold of your consciousness and try to realize that this self is actually the sort of assistant I have just described, capable of carrying out all your desires, of executing all your purposes, of realizing all your ambitions, to the exact extent of your belief in its powers, and you will get some idea of what it can accomplish for you. This assistant is closer to you than your breath, nearer than your heartbeat, a faithful helper walking by your side all through life, to execute your faintest wish, to carry out your desires, to help you achieve your aims. Every bit of help, of encouragement, of support that you give to this other self will add to the magnificence and splendor of your destiny. On the other hand, all negative vicious thoughts, all selfishness, greed, and envy, all doubts and fears, all the discouraging, destructive thoughts you entertain will impair and weaken your assistant in exact proportion to their intensity and persistency. In fact, it rests with you whether your assistant shall be your greatest help, a heavenly friend and servant, or your greatest hindrance, your worst enemy. It doesn't matter what we call them, the subconscious and conscious self, or the subjective and objective mind. We are all conscious that these are two forces constantly at work in us. One commands and the other obeys. We know that one of these, the subjective mind, does not originate its acts, but gets its instructions from the objective mind, which contains the willpower. Experience shows us that the subjective or subconscious mind, which I have called our personal assistant, is a servant which obeys our will, carries out our wishes, 
and registers in the brain a faithful record of not only our every thought, word, and act, but of everything we see and everything we hear others say. Our subconscious mind is the record storehouse of all that has ever happened to us. Every thought, every experience, whatever passes before the eye, or that we see or hear or feel, is registered accurately in our brain by our subconscious mind. Now, if this other self, the personal assistant, the subconscious mind, or whatever we choose to call it, has such enormous power, why can it not be trained to work for us when we are asleep, as well as when we are awake? Have you ever thought of the possibilities for spiritual and mental development during sleep? Has it ever occurred to you that while the processes of repair and growth are proceeding normally in the body, the mind may also be expanding, the soul as well as the body may be growing? As a matter of fact, we never awake the same exact being as when we went to sleep. We are either better or worse. We changed while we slept. While our senses were wrapped in slumber, the subjective mind was busily at work. It was either building up or tearing down. By an intelligent, systematic direction of this sleepless faculty of the brain, we can actually make it create for us along the line of our desires. But as it is, most of us, by not putting the mind in proper condition before going to sleep, not only do not intelligently use this marvelous creative agency, but destroy all possibility of beneficial results from its action. We forget that it is as necessary to prepare the mind for sleep as it is to prepare the body. The first thing to remember is that the way we feel when we awake in the morning depends on how we were feeling or thinking when we went to sleep. If we go to bed holding a grudge against a neighbor with a resolve to get back at somebody who has hurt us, if we have hatred or jealousy in our heart, if we are envious of another's success, and if we go to sleep nursing these feelings, we awake in a depressed, exhausted state feeling bitter, pessimistic, irritable, and unhappy. The destructive spirit was at work all night, running amuck among the delicate brain and nerve cells, furiously tearing down what beneficent nature had taken such pains to upbuild. But when we take pleasant, kindly, loving thoughts to bed with us, we awake refreshed, in a happy, contented frame of mind. Our sleepless faculties spent the hours in upbuilding, performing friendly functions for us during the night. Few people ever think of preparing the mind for sleep, yet it is even more necessary than it is to prepare the body. Most of us take great pains to put the latter in order. We undress, maybe take a warm bath, perhaps massage the face with lotion, we make sure that our bedroom is properly heated or cooled and that our bed is clean and comfortable. But to the matter of preparing our minds, we don't give it a thought. Instead of making our subconscious mental processes build for us in the night, we allow them to tear down much of what we have built during the day. Many of us grow old, haggard, and wrinkled in the night, when just the reverse ought to be happening. For nature herself has ordained that nighttime should be the building the renewing time of life. If we were only to prepare the mind for sleep with the same intelligence and care that we prepare the body, if we were to give it a cleansing mental bath, wiping from memory slate all the black, discordant pictures, all the worries and fears which vexed and perplexed us during the day, instead of having the nightmare panorama passing and repassing before us during the night, robbing us of needed rest and neutralizing our upbuilding, recuperative forces, what a difference it would make in our achievement, in our lives. I know people whose lives have been revolutionized by adopting the practice of putting themselves in a harmonious condition, getting in tune with the infinite, before going to sleep. Formerly they were in the habit of retiring in a bad mood, 
tired and discouraged over anticipated evils, worrying about all sorts of things. They would discuss their misfortunes at night with their spouses, and then stew over unfortunate conditions in their affairs, their mistakes, and the possible evil consequences that might result from them. Naturally, their minds were in an upset condition when they fell asleep, and as might have been expected, the melancholy, black, ugly pictures of the misfortunes they feared, vividly exaggerated in the stillness of the night, became etched deeper and deeper into their brains, making real rest and reinvigoration almost impossible. When they reformed their habits, changed their thoughts, and retired in a peaceful frame of mind with the intention of going to sleep, instead of tossing and turning over their troubles, their business and lives straight away began to improve. They were stronger, fresher, more vigorous, more resourceful, better able to cope with difficulties, to make plans and to carry them out, than when they were depleting their physical and mental resources by robbing themselves of their best friend, nature's restorative, sleep. Many people tell me that they cannot stop thinking after they go to bed. Their brains are so active doing their next day's work that they cannot stop the mind from turning for hours. Of course, you cannot stop all thinking the first night you begin to form this new habit, when you have practiced the old bed thinking habit for years, when perhaps as far back as you can remember, you have gone to bed every night worrying, worrying, thinking, thinking, planning ahead for days, for weeks, for months, planning ahead perhaps even for the coming year. But if you persist and make it a cast iron rule to allow no anxieties or fears, no business troubles or discords of any kind, enter your bedroom. You will succeed in accomplishing your object. Think of your bedroom as the one place sacred to rest and restoration, where the things that trouble and harass and vex you during the daytime shall find no entrance. Put the following quotation over the door or in some conspicuous place where you can see it. This is my spiritual refuge, the place of supreme peace and power in my life, from which all discord must be shut out. Then, when you undress and lie down, say to yourself, I have done my best during the day. Now I am going to stop thinking, stop worrying and planning, and get a good refreshing sleep to prepare me for tomorrow's work. Clear your mind not only of all anxious, worrying thoughts about work, but also of all ill will or hatred toward others. Resolve that you will not harbor an unpleasant, bitter, or unkind thought toward any human being, that you will wipe from your memory everything you have ever had against anyone, that you will forget whatever is unpleasant in the past and start again with a clean slate. Just imagine that the words harmony peace, love, goodwill to every living thing are emblazoned in letters of light all over the walls of your room. Repeat them over and over until that other self, that personal assistant just below the threshold of your consciousness, becomes saturated with the ideas they convey. And after a while, you will drop into slumber with a serene, poised mind, a mind filled with happy, joyous, creative thoughts. If you are a victim of insomnia and go to bed every night with the thought firmly fixed that you are not going to sleep, you are, to a great extent, the victim of your belief. The conviction in your subconscious mind that there is something wrong with your sleeping ability is largely responsible for the continuance of your trouble. We know by experience that we can convince ourselves of almost anything by affirming it long enough and often enough. The constant repetition after a while establishes the belief in our minds that the thing is true. We thus can establish the sleep habit just as easily as any other habit. It is perfectly possible by means of affirmation, the constant repetition of heart-to-heart -heart talks with yourself, to regain your power to sleep normally. Your subconscious self, 
that side of your nature which presides over the involuntary or automatic functions during sleep, as well as awake, can be made to obey your commands, or rather suggestions, to overcome your insomnia. Say this to your inner self, you know there is no reason why you should not sleep. There is no defect in your physical or mental makeup which keeps you awake. You ought to sleep soundly so many hours every night. There is no reason why you should not, and you are going to do so tonight. If you play as hard as you work, refresh and rejuvenate yourself with recreation and good times when your work is done, and then at a regular hour every night prepare your mind for sleep by giving it a mental bath and clothing it in beautiful thoughts, you will in a short time establish the habit of a sound, peaceful, refreshing sleep. Whatever else you do or do not do, form the habit of calling on the great spirit within you before retiring. Leave there a message of growth, of self-betterment, and self-enlargement. Seek a solution to that which you yearn for and long to realize but do not know how to attain. This earnest call, this request for something higher and nobler, will be registered by your subconscious and work like a leaven during the night. As time goes on, all the building forces within you will unite in furthering your aim and helping you to realize your vision, whatever it may be. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. For free transcripts, please go to livinghour.org. Today's podcast was brought to you by Etitude, makers of fine organic bedding and accessories. Get 10% off your purchase with the special coupon code INSPIRATION. Visit them online now at etitude.com. That's E-T-T-I-T-U-D-E.com. Thanks for listening. I look forward to talking with you next time. Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast, brought to you in part by Book of Zen, makers of wearable inspiration for a better world. Today's podcast has been edited and adapted from the book The Architects of Fate by Orison Sweat Martin, published in 1896. It is a great purpose which gives meaning to life. It unifies all our powers binds them together in one cable, makes strong and united what was weak, separated, scattered. To succeed today, a person must concentrate all their faculties of mind on one unwavering aim, and have a tenacity of purpose which means death or victory. Every other inclination which tempts you from your aim must be suppressed. An individual may starve on a dozen half-learned trades or occupations, but grow rich and famous upon one trade thoroughly mastered, even though it be the humblest. Do not struggle to do two things at once. Throw your entire strength upon whatever you do. An intense energy should characterize everything you undertake, even your recreation. Genius is intensity, developing a power of concentration which makes you oblivious of everything outside your aim. For example, Victor Hugo wrote his masterpiece Notre Dame during the revolution of 1830, while the bullets were whistling across his garden. He shut himself up in one room, locking up his clothes lest they should tempt him to go out into the street and then spent most of that winter wrapped in a big gray comforter, pouring his very life into his work. 
Those who push themselves to the front of the world stage are not the shallow players who impersonate all parts. They are the men and women who choose a specialty and master it completely. A one talent individual who decides upon a definite object accomplishes more than the person with ten talents who scatters their energy and never knows exactly what to do. The weakest human being, by concentrating their powers upon one thing, can accomplish something, while the strongest, by dispersing their energy over many goals, may fail to accomplish anything. Drop by drop, continually falling water can wear a passage through the hardest rock. A great purpose is cumulative, and, like a great magnet, it attracts all that is kindred along the stream of life. It is the individual of intense purpose directed toward a single idea who turns neither to the right nor to the left, though a paradise tempt them, who cuts their way through obstacles and forges to the front. Concentration is the keynote of every success story. We all have the ability enough to succeed. The rays of our faculties taken separately are all right, but many of us are powerless to collect them, to bring them all to bear upon a single spot. Versatile individuals, universal geniuses, are often weak because they have no power to concentrate their talents upon one point, and this makes all the difference between success and failure. One talent utilized in a single direction will do infinitely more than ten talents scattered. The worst scholar in school or college often has, in practical life, success that far outstrips the valedictorian, simply because what ability they have, they employ for a definite object, while the other, depending upon their general ability and brilliant prospects, never concentrates their powers. What a sublime spectacle it is to see a person going straight toward their goal, cutting their way through difficulties and surmounting obstacles which dishearten others as though they were stepping stones. It is, of course, fashionable these days to ridicule the person of one idea, but those who have changed the world have been the men and women of a single aim. No person can make their mark on this age of specialties who is not a person of one idea, one supreme aim, one master passion. The individual who would make themselves felt on this bustling planet must focus all of their attention on a single point. A wavering aim, a faltering purpose, has no place in the 21st century. Mental shiftlessness is the cause of many a failure. The world is full of unsuccessful people who spend their lives sending empty buckets down empty wells. We should guard against a talent which we cannot hope to practice in perfection, says Goethe. Improve it as we may, we shall always, in the end, when the merit of the matter has become apparent to us, painfully lament the loss of time and strength devoted to such botching. An old proverb says, the master of one trade will support a wife and seven children, and the master of seven will not support themselves. The individual who succeeds has a program. They fix their course and adhere to it. They lay their plans and execute them. They go straight to their goal. They are not pushed this way and that every time a difficulty is thrown in their path. If they can't get over it, they go through it. Constant and steady use of your faculties under a guiding purpose gives strength and power, while the use of faculties without an aim or end only weakens them. The mind must be focused on a definite end, or like machinery without a balance wheel, it will rack itself into pieces. Stick to your aim. The constant changing of one's occupation is fatal to all success. How many young people fail to reach the point of mastery in one line of work 
before they get discouraged and venture into something else. How easy to see the thorns in one's own profession or vocation, and only the roses in that of another. Artists will tell you that there is nothing in nature so ugly and disagreeable that intense light will not make it beautiful. Likewise, the complete mastery of one profession will render even the driest details interesting. The consciousness of thorough knowledge, the habit of doing everything to a finish, gives a feeling of strength, of superiority, which takes the drudgery out of an occupation. The more completely we master a vocation, the more thoroughly we enjoy it. In fact, the professional who has found their place and becomes master in it can scarcely be induced to become anything else. To be successful is to find your sphere and fill it, to get into your place and master it. There is a sense of great power in a vocation after a person has reached the point of mastery in it, the point of productiveness, the point where their skill begins to bring in returns. When this point of mastery is reached, all the knowledge, skill, character, influence, and credit previously gained comes to your aid, and soon you discover the secret of prosperity. Meanwhile, the person who has half learned several trades and got discouraged and stopped just short of point of mastery, just this side of success, is a failure because they didn't go far enough. They did not press on to the point at which their acquisition would have been profitable. In spite of the fact that nearly all very successful people have made their life work of one thing, we continuously see young men and women flitting about from occupation to occupation, trade to trade, in one thing today and another tomorrow, as if they could go from one thing to another by simply turning a switch as if they could run as well on another track as on the one they have left, regardless of the fact that no two careers have the same gauge. This fickleness, this disposition to shift about from one occupation to another, seems to be peculiar to American life, so much so that when a young adult meets a friend whom they have not seen for some time, the commonest question to ask is, what are you doing now? showing the improbability or uncertainty that they are doing today what they were doing when they last met. Some people think that if they simply, quote, stick with it, they will succeed. But this is not so. Working without a plan is as foolish as going to sea without a compass. A ship which has broken its rudder in mid-ocean may keep at it with a full head of steam, but it never arrives anywhere. It never reaches any port unless by accident, and if it does find a haven, its cargo may not be suited to the people, the climate, or conditions among which it has accidentally drifted. The ship must be directed to a definite port, for which its cargo is adapted, and where there is a demand for it, and it must aim steadily for that port through sunshine and storm, through tempest and fog. Likewise, you who would succeed must not drift about rudderless in the ocean of life. You must not only steer straight toward your destined port when the ocean is smooth, when the currents and winds serve, but you must keep your course in the very teeth of the wind and the tempest, and even when enveloped in the fogs of disappointment and mists of opposition. On the prairies of South America, there grows a flower that always inclines in the same direction. If a traveler loses their way and has neither compass nor chart, by turning to this flower they will find a guide on which they can implicitly rely. For no matter how the rains descend or the winds blow, it leaves always point to the north. Similarly, there are many women and men whose purposes are so well known whose aims are so constant that no matter what difficulties they may encounter or what opposition they may meet, you can tell almost to a certainty where they will come out. They may be delayed by headwinds and counter-currents, but they will always head for the port 
and will steer straight towards the harbor. You know to a certainty that whatever else they may lose, they will not lose their compass or rudder. To fix a wandering life and give it direction is not an easy task, but a life which has no definite aim is sure to be frittered away in empty and purposeless dreams. Listless triflers, busy idlers, purposeless busybodies are seen everywhere. A healthy, definite purpose is a remedy for a thousand ills which attend aimless lives. Discontent, dissatisfaction, flee before a definite purpose. An aim takes the drudgery out of life, scatters doubts to the winds, and clears up the gloomiest creeds. What we do without a purpose begrudgingly, with a purpose becomes a delight and no work is well done or healthfully done which is not enthusiastically done. It is just that added element which makes our work immortal. Mere energy though is not enough. It must be concentrated on some steady unwavering aim. What is more common today than unsuccessful geniuses or failures with enormous talents? Indeed, unrewarded genius has become a proverb. Every town has unsuccessful educated and talented people. Because education is of no value, talent is worthless unless it can do something, achieve something. What the 21st century needs are men and women who can do one thing without losing their identity or individuality, or becoming narrow, cramped, or dwarfed. Nothing can take the place of an all-absorbing purpose. Education will not. Genius will not. Talent will not. Industry will not. Willpower will not. The purposeless life must ever be a failure. What good are powers, faculties, and skills unless we can use them for a purpose? What good would a chest of tools do a carpenter unless he could use them. A college education, a head full of knowledge, are worth little to those who cannot use them to some definite end. The person without a purpose never leaves their mark upon the world. They have no individuality. They are absorbed in the mass, lost in the crowd, weak, wavering, incompetent. Their outlines of individuality and angles of character have been worn off, planed down to suit the common thought until they have, as an individual, been lost in the throng of humanity. Therefore you who would do something great in this short life must apply yourself to your work with such a concentration of forces that to the idle spectators who live only to amuse themselves it will look like insanity. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour. For free transcripts of our podcasts, visit us online at livinghour.org. Today's podcast was sponsored in part by autosuggestion.io. Transform your life in 30 days. Discover the autosuggestion sound method at autosuggestion.io. And by Book of Zen, makers of wearable inspiration and motivational gifts. Visit them online at bookofzen.com. Subscribe to the Inspirational Living Podcast by looking us up in the iTunes Store. If you're using an Android phone, download the Stitcher app and you'll find us on there. We deliver new podcasts twice a week, every Tuesday and Thursday. Thanks for joining us. I look forward to talking to you next time.